Hey, true crime fans, Dr. Cassidy here. Today, we're going to be talking about Stacy Castor. She was dubbed the Black Widow, and for very good reason. She's oh, really uh, something else. I mean, she's got some issues or had some issues. Um, she was an she's a, was an American convicted murderer from Weeds. Fort, New York, and in 2009, she was found guilty of intentionally poisoning, poisoning her then-husband, David Castor, with antifreeze in 2005 and attempting to murder the, her, her daughter, Ashley Wallace, with crushed pills mixed in with vodka, orange juice, and Sprite in 2007. In addition, she's suspected of having murdered her first husband, Michael Wallace, in 2000. His grave lay next to David Castor's until David's remains were disinterred on in 2016 and buried elsewhere by his son. Now, this made national news uh, when it hit, and there's a 2020 show on it. Um, there might be a, I think there's a snapped, maybe. Let me see. Forensic Files. It's Forensic Files, um, which would make sense because, the, you know, the, the chemicals that she used, the things that she did, they were able to, you know, convict her based on those. So we will look at, let's look at the murders first. In late 1999, Wallace began feeling intermittently ill. Now, remember, Ma Michael Wallace was her first husband. and. She was, um, they had been married in 1988 and she, and then he died in 2000. So he was just getting intermittently ill and family members variously remember him as acting unsteady, coughing, and seemingly swollen. As his inexplicable sickness persisted over the holiday season, his family encouraged him to seek medical care, but he died in early 2000 before he could do so. Their daughter, Ashley, was 12 at the time and had been alone with him. She had noticed his ill appearance that day, but thought nothing of it. Physicians told Castor that her husband had died of a heart attack, although Wallace's sister was skeptical and requested an autopsy for Wallace. Castor refused, saying she believed the doctors were correct. In 2003, Stacy married David Castor, whose surname she used from that point forward. Castor was the owner of an air conditioning installation and repair company, and Stacy served as his office manager. In August 2005, at 2 o'clock one afternoon, Castor called her local sheriff's office to tell them that her husband had locked himself in their bedroom for a day following an argument and was not responding to his cell phone. When he did not appear at their shared workplace, she had become worried. She claimed he was depressed. Unable to get a response, Sergeant Robert Willoughby of the Onondaga um, County Sheriff's Department kicked in the door of the bedroom and found David Castor lying dead. Among the items near his body were a container of antifreeze and a full half glass of bright green liquid. Willoughby says he remembers that Castor screamed, He's not dead! He's not dead! Very dramatic, which is typically how that happens. You know, they put on a show. The coroner reported that David Castro had committed suicide through a self-administered lethal dose of antifreeze. But when police found Stacy Castro's fingerprints on the antifreeze glass and located a turkey baster that had David Castro's DNA on the tip, they began to suspect Stacy Castro had engineered her husband's death. They believed Castor had used the turkey baster to force feed him once he became too physically weak. The detectives on the case ordered wiretappings on Castor's house. They listened in on phone calls for any unusual conversations. In addition, they set up cameras overlooking Castor's house and the grave sites of her husband's, who had been buried side by side at Castor's request. Detectives reasoned that if Castor were truly genuine about her love for her late husband's, that she would eventually visit their graves. They wanted to observe her behavior while there. Castor, however, never visited. The investigators soon felt the only way to prove Castor responsible for both homicides was to have Wallace's body exhumed. A toxicology screening ruled that Wallace had also been killed through antifreeze poisoning. Now, up, up until this point, she had not been... No one suspected her. 
But, you know, with the death of her second husband um, and I I would imagine uh, just some general distrust from the police department of how things played out, she became a suspect. And she really fought for his body not to be exhumed. It was a big controversy. But, of course, they had enough probable cause and the judge granted that. Um, and good that he did, because, of course, we know the toxicology screening ruled that he was, you know, killed through antifreeze poisoning. Um, now, in September of 2007, amid mounting evidence that Castor had murdered both of her as her husbands, she began to panic. She had actually gone to been she had the police had asked her to come into their precinct and do another interview. She did several interviews with them. But in the latest interview, she had said, when I poured the antifreeze, but she cut it off right before she said antifreeze. Um, She said, so when I poured the antifreeze, and then she stopped and said, when I poured his drink, um, because remember there were two glasses on the nightstand. One had the antifreeze, one had a drink in it. so she corrected herself quickly, and of course, I would we would call that a Freudian slip. That pretty much sealed the deal for the police. They were like, "Yeah, we got her. This is this is her doing," and she basically just you know inadvertently told us that she had you know poured the um, antifreeze and killed her husband. So, which you got to think about is not. I mean, how. St- how stupid do you have to be to use a turkey baster and then leave it on the top, just the top of the trash to where when, if anyone looked in it, they would see this turkey baster who has a turkey baster out that has green fluid in it. Just, she just didn't think it through. I I personally believe that she got away with it the first time with her first husband. So she thought she would get away with it this time. And of course she would have had they not had those suspicions about her. But what she did next was really just heinous. And one of the, one of the reasons I wanted to cover this story is because, um, you know, we talk a lot about these serial killers or these um, mass murderers, how they have some sort of something in their life that triggered their behaviors. But I also do believe that there are people who are just born evil. I think there are people who just don't matter what their childhood was like. It doesn't matter what factors they have, what opportunities they have or didn't have. They're just evil people. And and I think she is one of those. Her childhood, before I get into her last act, um, her childhood was fairly normal. Um, She was the daughter of Jerry Daniels and Judy Eaton, who met Michael Wallace when she was 17. And in 1985, they bonded immediately. The couple married and had their first daughter, Ashley, in 1988. In 91, they had a second daughter, Bree. So Castor was employed by an ambulance dispatch company while Wallace worked nights as a mechanic. But the family had little money, so they were poor. I guess working poor would be what I would call it. I don't have an exact dollar figure, but just based on today, um, today's uh, economy, I'd probably call them working poor. According to Castor, Wallace was very close to Bree, showing a favoritism that Castor made up for by becoming best friends with elder daughter Ashley. Despite their closeness with their children, the couple grew apart, and it was rumored that each was having affairs. So. Obviously, she had favoritism toward Brie, which was her baby, and then she chose to become, instead of a parent, a best friend to Ashley. Uh, and and it was really disturbing. If you watch the 2020 show or the Forensic, forensic Files, um, one of them goes into a little bit of detail about that, and it and it talks about how you know she would encourage Ashley to drink with her and. Um, just do things that a that a mother would never want their kid to do with them, let alone with anyone else, but certainly not encourage it in their own home. So she, from the get-go, was very unusual, um, just had a really different 
take on how relationships should be. Now, and really the only factor we know of is she had, in her early childhood, they were poor, which we know, you know, if you have limited resources, that can cause you to have some significant issues. But, I mean, there's millions of people who are raised poor and they don't turn out to be serial killers. So um, the argument for that is very uh, weak. Then you also have, um, you know, it seems that she married, you know, somewhat young. I mean, she was 18. Um, I think that's young. Certainly it's not abnormal. I mean, there are people who get married 17, 18, and they turn out perfectly fine. But um, as we know, this did not turn out fine. After both of her husbands had been killed and she was, they were really um, closing in on her. The police were really closing in on her. They had lots of evidence. They just needed, you know, the smoking gun, if you will. Um, and they were about to get that. So in September of 2007, amid that mounting evidence that Castor had murdered both of her husbands, she began to panic. After she learned police had exhumed Wallace's body and found traces of antifreeze in the system, she was believed to have devi devised a plan to help set her daughter Ashley up for the murders. On Ashley's first day of college, investigators came to her school to question her about her father's death and to inform her that he had been poisoned instead of having a heart attack. An upset Ashley called Castor. Soon after, Ashley said, Castor invited her to come to the family home in Liverpool and drink together. Castor said they had been through enough emotional stress and needed to relax. Ashley agreed because Castor was not only her mother, but her best friend. So she had... Castor had been very successful at building that relationship with her daughter. She completely trusted her mother. She had no reason not to trust her mother. Um, and there's actually a snippet of the phone conversation that Ashley had with her mother right after they left her at school uh, that you can see on 2020. And it's, you know, her reaction to learning that they had been to her daughter's school to question her about these things. Um, wasn't really what I think I would expect a mother to, how they would react. Um, so that, for me, was a big red flag when I heard that. But <clears throat> what she did was they, the prosecutors argued that the computer-generated note where Ashley confesses to killing Wallace and David had actually been written by Castor. What happened was... Um, she decided, as I said, that she was going to uh, murder Ashley and frame her for the murders of David and Wallace. So when she brought her home that night, or when she came over that night to drink, she started trying to poison her with their drinks. Um, and she was successful in, in knocking her out. And she had evidently already written out this letter this long letter that her daughter supposedly wrote that explained that it was that she was the one who um, poisoned her stepfather and her father that she that they were abusive and that she wanted to save her family and just just a bunch of craziness trying to um, point all of that attention to her and not on her mother. So when they got to court, prosecutors argued that the computer generated note where Ashley confesses, quote unquote, to killing Wallace and David, it had actually been written by Castor. Ashley was 12 at the time of her father's death, of uh, her father Wallace's death. So a 12 year old, I don't even know that a 12 year old would know that you can die from antifreeze. So I, the whole idea of that is just outrageous. Um, when brought on the stand, Ashley testified that she did not murder either her father or her stepfather, nor did she write the suicide note. Um, I said that she was, that, that Wallace was successful in, or I'm sorry, Castor was successful in 